You couldn't ask for more perfection. Hi, I'm Dean Wolf. I'm going to give my album review to, yes, Topographic Oceans. Tales from Topographic Oceans, pardon me. That's sort of the uh, shorthand, you know, among us Yes fans. As far as the album cover, it's Roger Dean. Beautiful artwork. I think Roger Dean is just inseparable from the whole Yes feel. He's virtually a member of Yes by virtue of his graphic design. It's so essential to the whole package. It has, of course, four sides, but it only has four songs. Each side is a song. And it's so ambitious. They'd already done Close to the Edge, which turned out to be a massive success commercially and critically. It still is to this day. It's still rated often as one of the best progressive rock albums there are. Tales from Topographic Oceans, however, is not derivative. It's not Close to the Edge part two, three, four, five. <laughs> it's, it is completely unique. Close to the Edge had Bill Bruford on drums, and this album had Alan White. So we have a different feel already because you've got that different musician in there. Uh, as far as all the other musicians, John Anderson uh, singing, of course, Steve Howe, uh, Chris Squire, and Rick Wakeman on keyboards. If Bill Bruford wanted to have anything to do with this album, I'm pretty sure side three and four he would have been quite interested in. Alan White really shines in this album as a drummer. He's, he's incredibly energetic, creative, very complex. He's doing some really experimental stuff. So if you really want to see Alan White at his most creative, I think this is one of the most creative albums Alan White has been involved in. Well, let's move along to some of the other musicians. Of course, there's John Anderson singing. He and Steve Howe wrote a lot of the parts of the song while they were touring before before it was time to make a new album. And um, I think he was reading uh, some yogi stuff. So it's mystical, m magical, uh, spiritual. I guess you could say religious too. I mean, the first song's called um, The Revealing Science of God. And yet it's funny, here I am decades later, and I realized I didn't know what the names of all the songs. Why is that? I think because this album is so cohesive. If you're going to make a song that's 20 minutes long, it's, it's, uh, it's a real talent, and it's a real exercise too, an incredible exercise. I listened to this last night, plus the two songs where they're doing a run through which i'd never heard before which is very interesting so it gives you a, a, a view into the back door of uh, what, what was happening in the studio what an undertaking just just incredibly daunting chris squire is a standout in this album because his bass playing goes all the places you would not expect it to go and his tone is just incredible and his singing as well we often take that for granted yes are like the Beach Boys, almost the progressive rock Beach Boys, as far as three-part harmonies. You got Chris Squire singing higher than Anderson sometimes, or, or within that range, and then you got Steve Howe, who's a little bit lower, more like a human being, <laughs> like us mere mortals. So Chris Squire, his tone is searing, his his playing and his ideas and his composition are key. To the music. I mean, everyone in this album is keyed. No one can do topographic oceans and not carry your weight. You have to carry your weight. And everyone did so well on this album. It made me think too, Chris Squire reminded me a little of Paul McCartney um, because Paul McCartney played a bass in a really unique style. I'm pretty sure no one really touched Paul as far as uh, composition and as a bass player. His use of melody in through the, using the bass. Chris Squire, I really think he kind of took the torch that Paul McCartney had sort of uh, lit and really um, took it five or six notches up. I, I can only say one word about Chris Squire in this album. Perfect. And it goes for pretty well everyone on this album. Let's move down the list. We've got Rick Wakeman. He had gone on record uh, in the past sort of in a negative light. But the fact was he was leaving the band. So, of course, he's that was part of his whole... Uh, worldview at that time. For some reason, he was not happy in the band. He was very opposite to everybody. They're all into vegetarianism and didn't drink and stuff. And he was like heavily drinking and he loved his, you know, T-bone steaks and all that. Kind of a clash going on there. But years later, he came around and denounced his former criticism and said it's a good album. And I, I'm glad he did. His work on it is amazing too. And it made me realize I love Rick Wakeman when he's doing a lot of piano work in this album, acoustic piano. To me, that's very key to the whole sound of Yes, and also a lot of 
analog synthesizers. I'm not crazy about the digital synthesizer work, but as far as the Yes classic sound, also he used the, the Mellotron a lot, which is wonderful in this album, I think. So again, Rick Wakeman did amazing work on this album. So Alan White was new to this whole concept of an album of four songs with four sides. He was a shining example. In fact, I think some of his brightest, best, most creative, most unique, innovative drumming was done on Topographic Oceans. I actually think that Alan uh, White completely matched, as far as some super creativity, as Bill Bruford. See, uh, if you listen to side three and four, you will actually think Bill Bruford, I bet you, would, would have loved to have been involved in those because they were just, there was some really out there stuff on those sides. There was some really bizarre work and lots of uh, textural drumming and some really primal drumming. So uh, just real, a lot of energy. But Alan White's probably best work was Topographic Oceans. Well, John Anderson, I mean, what's to say? He's superhuman. His voice is as, as of an angel. The lyrics are great. Uh, if the words pop out, I listen to them. I don't listen start to finish in a song to lyrics. I, f I always focus on the music and the melody. That's my main focus. The thing I like about John Anderson's style is he he would not write a phrase just because it had a meaning. He Sometimes he'd write it and sing it just because the words sounded great. So he used words like, like an instrument. Getting over overhanging trees, you know, that's one of the lines that stands out to me from Topographic Oceans. And there's just a sort of a feel that comes out of the actual phonetic use of a word. But now we just got to talk about Steve Howe. Steve Howe, of course, one of my favorite guitarists in the world. I actually met him once. We did a fist bump and I was, I made my day. He really showed the spectrum, the wide spectrum of his vision for music as a, as a guitarist. He was not restricted to just playing an electric guitar, not even an acoustic steel string guitar. He was also going into nylon string guitar, you know, like classical. He had a, a sitar guitar. So he, he had an Indian on feel to it. Um, he did a slide guitar. He had an amazing sounding amp um, and guitar on some of this album. It was just some nice feedback, some fuzzy distortion parts, some quieter, uh, straightforward electric guitar clean stuff. Completely shining like all the guys in the band. <laughs> One thing that I thought was interesting when I was listening last night is I've never compared Yes to King Crimson. But when I was listening to Side 3, there is some really weirdness like side three is kind of the most weird side of all of them and in side three the song is called the ancient giants under the sun it also has some very normal stuff too it's it sort of uh crosses a point where all of the weird stuff is sort of put aside and steve howe was playing some nice classical stuff <laughs> This is something I learned when I was a teenager. I sort of figured it out by ear. I just really um, internalized all of uh, his work with Yes and his solo work as well. Playing it on a guitar uh, just it takes it to a new depth as far as absorbing music is. That's the next step you can do when you listen to a song and you love it is to try to recreate it yourself and sort of try to visit that actual physical place where he's playing it. But you know, there's also there's also a spiritual core behind the music, which you want to tap as well. So, Topographic Oceans. It's just, um, for me, it is, it's, it's, it's got dreamy music. It's got exciting music. It's got a lot of strong melodies. They, they sing this part where it, sound, it reminds me of the Coke commercial. I don't know if any of you remember the Coke commercials back in the 70s. They're saying, oh, da, 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 da. There's a sort of a feel there that matched uh, the, with the Yes album. Uh, so it goes something like this. What happened to the song we once knew so well? You know that? There's another funny story about it I'd say about this album is my cousin Mark, Mark Reiter, who's a, a fine, fine artist. Maybe he's an abstract artist. Anyways, he had this on cassette, and he used, he used to think that John Anderson was singing... And I do sing very well. You know that line. If you if you know this album, you know exactly what I mean. You're not seeing 
very many bands play and perform uh, to this caliber. I mean, to to compose to this caliber for 20-minute suites of music with multiple harmonies all throughout and uh, super complex and changing time signatures, changing feel, um, you know, going from, it's like going from one room of a mansion to another room, you know, and the songs kind of segue through this mansion of ideas. And I just love the feel of the ancientness here. You see a, a sort of a pyramid there going on. And um, so the dreaminess as well. This, again, this is Roger Dean capturing very well the spirit of the album. With So for me, Topographic Oceans is a 10 out of 10. It's just a perfect album. Um, it's The pace is perfect for what it is because it's it's one continuous thread and it starts inside one and it ends inside four and you don't hear it again for the rest of time because yes has never uh, visited this kind of thing again even though there's another album coming up after this where they do another full size sweep suite and there are other songs that they write that are over 15 minutes long they never go back and regurgitate this this is a one-off piece of um history for yes and music in general it just it's just incredibly special all right so just quick summary side one perfection of substance and arrangement it had that sort of positive this togetherness and this unity feeling and beautiful melodies and then you've got uh, side two which is a little more like middle earthian uh it sort of sounds a little more like 15th century instruments side three is where the band all came to the studio dressed in loincloths and body warrior paint you know uh, on their face whatever and this is just a primal feeling to it it's it's the closest and the only time i think yes actually sounded kind of like king crimson and that's a good name for it too the ancient because it comes off feeling very very primal and sort of caveman kind of thing you know and then side four uh it's got a lot of melody like it's very very strong that's why i think ritual stands out it has particularly iconic melodies from yes and also has an amazing bass solo which on the album is very short if you listen to the yes shows album i spread it out over two sides because it wouldn't fit all on one side there's a bass solo by chris squire which is fantastic make sure you check that out the live version of ritual there is a little bit hints of case of delirium which is actually coming up on their next album another thing about side four is, is these aliens uh, and drum combination and what i mean by that is like rick wakeman's playing is really alien kind of sounding sounds pairing up with alan white who's playing all kinds of unique rhythms and it's very abstract. It's really cool to hear Rick Wakeman play such abstract work. Nusom du Soleil is a final song. And there, like I say, Rick Wakeman playing the acoustic piano. Just this classic yes sound. Very warm. And then the end is a very passionate, uh, incredibly epic finale. I mean, just think of it. How daunting is that? You're going to make four songs, 20 minutes long. It has to start off right. You have to start the very first chapter correctly. And they do that. The album starts off like the sun is rising, like this, you know, the beams are just slowly glowing into the sky. That's how the album gets introduced. And then the very last side, the very last moments of it, it just, it just has this sort of like a, a, a gigantic being or something, just sort of breathing and, uh, and, and inhaling and exhaling. It's just, uh, well, it's just magical to me. You couldn't ask for more perfection as far as an opening and a closing it's just it's mind-bending i i listened to this again last night right through right now we're living in an era where your attention is being fought for constantly your attention is being stretched uh you're being attacked from all sides in a sense and it's not peaceful and this uh album sort of reminded me of the peace uh the peacefulness of uh what music should be about it should draw you in and just fulfill your spirit that's my review of Tales from Topographic Oceans, a very personal review. So thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you all later. Make sure you check out those little links of me playing uh, Topographic Oceans album on the guitar. Sort of my own arrangement, a little bit, part of it. Check it out. So spiraling out, it's Dean. Stay tuned for more. Bye.